Here's the deal. If you're not happy about God, no one else will know. And listen, you represent Him, and and if coming to church and a worship service is the only place you get your joy from, you're in deep trouble. Amen. Amen. God's really, really, really excited, and He's really happy, and and He's really pleased with you. He's not mad at you. Not bummed out. He doesn't want to kick you. He wants to celebrate you. And sometimes we go through hard times, like all of us do. And a lot of times those hard times become our life. And then we wear a hard time on our face. Come yeah. 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 on, I'm being real, dude. I mean, who here doesn't go through it? Anybody? Don't go through it? You're amazing. You need to give testimony about how you never went through it. Come on, I'm serious. Because the deal is, is that we go through stuff all the time. I mean, it does it ever stop? No, it doesn't. It doesn't stop. See, <clears throat> the trial's not your issue. The fire's not your issue. Who you see in the fire is your issue. Come on, you might not see. You might not see Jesus. You might just see your circumstance. You might just see your problems. You might just see what you're going through. You might. You might just see the hell you're going through and think that that's God putting you through it, trying to teach you something, and you're wrong. Just from the response that I get from when I talk about that means that people's picture of who God is is twisted. Why? See, because God doesn't come to teach you a lesson and spank you and say, come on. God celebrates you and says you're amazing and there's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy and we let him potter us and squeeze us and mold us into his image. Dude, I'm going to bring the real truth. Why? Because you need to be set free. You. Do you understand that I need to be set free from me, and once I'm free from me, I'm free from you, and I'm free from the world, and I'm free from circumstance, and then circumstance is no longer on my potter, and God really is. And it's amazing, because He potters me from the inside. Oh. <clears throat> Jesus sets up camp inside of you through the kingdom of God, through Holy Spirit, and He potters you from the inside. <clears throat> and He doesn't just like, remove the kings. <clears throat> he pops them out. Did you ever see a dead polar? Yeah. Or they, they attach it to the car, they twist it, and pull that thing, and it's like perfectly out again. God does that, like, boom, and it, your salvation works itself out with fear and trembling. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have all of you smile before the end of the day. Whether it's at my hair, at my, at my shoes, one of these ways, one of these things are going to make you smile today. <laughs> Looks like barefoot, doesn't it? It's crazy. I want to talk about some really good stuff. I want to talk about God. Amen. Come on, man. I've been a Christian for, it's going to be seven years. In October, it'll be seven years in the kingdom. It's amazing. I am still a baby Christian. Last time I was here, I had spiritual hoodies on. I still got them now. They're size four. <laughs> I still got them on. I'm still a baby in Christ. I don't want to grow up because I look at grown-ups and I don't want to be like them. Because we can so much, we can know so much and have so much stuff and have so much, so much teaching, so much stuff in here, and and do nothing with it and just be bound up with teaching. And and I'm, I'm good with teaching. Don't get me wrong, but you can be bound with it. We need a movement. <laughs> We need to move with this. We need to flow with God. We need Him to move through us. We need to release Him and actually let Him be God instead of like keeping Him in. Like you're, what happens is Satan hopes to pound you, bang, and hits you with a with a right hook or or a left jab or whatever, and he hits you and hopes to make you position yourself against God. And then all of a sudden, like because you've been taught that God allows this, and God allows that. And God allowed that, but maybe God's doing something. Maybe He allowed this for a purpose. And then we try to bring in a purpose into our life that maybe God did this, not realizing that it's really the enemy. It's not God at all. There are three things that need to line up in a Christian's life in order for you to be okay. Four things. First thing is you die. You die. That's the first thing. That's the priority. The second thing is to know how good God is. The third thing is to know who you are. 
And the fourth thing is to know what you have because of how good God is and because of who you are. Amen. So, first we die. Then we find out who God really is, that He's really good and He's amazing. And all that stuff that you blamed Him for wasn't Him. Otherwise, the snake gets away in the grass, slithers away, God takes the wrath, and all of a sudden, God's kind of good, but maybe He will, and maybe He won't. And well, maybe He did this, and maybe He did that, and maybe He's not going to do this, and who knows? And we handle God like a hot potato. Come on! It's not God saying, ah, I'm going to give him this and I'm going to give him that and I'm going to, well, let's touch him this way, let's touch him that way. Let's see if we can build some character in. Let's set a fire under his work, burn his job down so he doesn't have a place to work. That's not God. See, what happens is we've got our view and our, and our, our eye twisted and all of a sudden we blame blaming God for something that he never did. Are you with me? Kind of. I'm going to go somewhere and we'll get it. All right. thank you for, for whatever you got because you're amazing you're amazing God we just want to we just want to glorify you and give you honor in our life in everything we do in Jesus name ok if you can go to Psalm 67 please This weekend I was hanging out at McClure, McClure, is that what it is? We were just hanging out, preaching the cross. Who, who was there? Okay, talking about the blood of Jesus, which is really important, because it's all that we got, okay? It's the cross, it's everything, it's the finished work. It's, do you know it's possible for you to sing about the blood of Jesus and then to like worship God half-heartedly and then go out and cuss out your wife? Do you know that that's not okay? Okay, yeah, shit. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, let's read. Right, it says, "It says, God be merciful to us, and bless us, and cause His face to shine upon us. Why? That Your way may be known on earth." Your salvation among nations, all nations. God be merciful to us and bless us. And cause His face to shine upon us. Selah. That your name may be known on earth. Wow. Your salvation among the nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all people praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing 
for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations of the earth. Govern the nations on earth. It's crazy. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. And all of the earth, all the ends of the earth, shall fear him. Do you know, there's a, there's a thing that's happening in the world today where it's, it's not so much the people fearing you because of the love of God that's in your life, but the people fear us because we're hypocrites. <laughs> Do you know that that's true? They actually fear being around us. They don't want to be around us because they don't see Christ in us. They don't see anything that they want. So why would they come? Come on. This is a big, huge deal. So God says, He says, God, let your face shine upon us. Be merciful to us. And He showed mercy because judgment was put on Jesus Christ. All the judgment that we deserved, all the stuff, all the requirements against us, all the law that we couldn't walk out was put on Jesus Christ. He did it every, he who knew no sin, he became sin. So we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to become righteousness? What does it mean to become sin? I mean, come on, Jesus took upon his body. He was sinless, he was spotless, he didn't do anything. God, the reason why God was a God of wrath in the Old Testament is because God needed justice. It was justice. Do you know how many people are walking around right now with justice in their hearts? I need justice. They shouldn't have treated me like that way. I'm sick and tired of the way they do this. Or I'm sick and tired of the way they look at me. Or I'm sick and tired of what they say. I am so sick of them. You just reap judgment on yourself. And you've got no mercy in your heart. Therefore, then you'll get judgment. You think I'm wrong? You think this is twisted? I promise you this. It says that when you enter into a judgment place, it says first take the log out of your eye. Then you'll see clear to pull the splinter out of your brother's eye. You hypocrite. Think Jesus, it's a real deal. You know the only people that he rebuked were the hypocrites, the people that thought they knew everything and pointed out other people's faults and forgot that like they were full of them. This is huge. Do you know how upset I see people all the time? They did this and they said this and I can't believe they did. Well, they deserve this. Well, guess what? Then you deserve hell. Come on. What is the blood of Jesus? Did the blood of Jesus come to make you just forgiven? Or did the blood of Jesus come to set you free from you? The blood of Jesus came to set you free from you so that you would never hold an ought against anybody else. Why? Because if you hold an ought against them, then God holds ought against you. Why? Because you've entered back into the old covenant law. And you've got 613 laws to walk out in order to be okay with your dad. So simple for us to slip into hatred and anger and bitterness and all that trash. You know what it says in here? It says, God, be merciful to us. Okay. So, so guess what God did? He sent His Son. Wow. God, be merciful to us. See, there was no mercy in the last days except God didn't wipe them out. Because people like Moses stood in the gap and said, God, if you wipe them out, then wipe me out too. So there was no mercy except God didn't wipe them out. He let them let live. So he came up with the covenant and he says, you know, the blood of animals, you just apply it, and high priest, you come in, everything has to be perfect. Don't come in like dragging your feet, dude. Come in completely right, everything's good. You're following and obeying all the things and all the setup that I have for you. And he'd have a rope tied around his leg, he'd have bells around the bottom of his robe, he'd come into the high, he'd come into the temple, and he would come into the holy of holies, only him. And if the bells stopped, they'd drag him out because he was dead. That's pretty strict. That's pretty judgmental. That's not very much mercy. But he was mercy enough to, to not wipe us out. Come on. So, so the high priest would go in there and apply blood. Do you know that when he left, he left his conscience was still violated. The high priest. The high priest still. Why? Because there was no way for him to be able to, to do the law. So, so even though he walked accordingly to what to what he thought was right, even though he willed to do the high priest. Even though he wanted to do it, he couldn't. And even though he willed to do it, he didn't. Why? Because it was sin in him. Do you understand? I preached it last night that you no longer have sin nature. Why? Because God gave you a brand new one. 
How can you be a partaker of sin nature and still walk in the divine nature? You can't. Your dual nature is God? No. And He created you to be just like Him. You guys better think real hard about the mercy thing. Because it's really good. You know when someone cuts you off and you and you get angry and you're hard at them and you glare at them? Do you know that you just pass judgment? Do you, do you know repentance is amazing? Repentance isn't, God, please forgive me. Repentance is, wow, that was twisted. God, thank you for you created me to be. Come on, repentance isn't begging God to forgive you. Because if you beg Him to forgive you, you've got to wonder if He ever did. Okay, let's get back to this. So God, be merciful to us and bless us. See, God wants to bless you. See, God showed mercy through His Son, and Jesus hung on a tree. He who knew no sin became sin, so that you might become the righteousness of God. Wow, when you become the righteousness of God, you have to understand what righteousness means. Why? Because righteousness is what the, old, the whole Old Testament was about. The law was in place that if people walked it out, they would attain it. So if they attained it, they were right in the eyes of God, but there was no way for them to attain it. So Jesus comes, He attains righteousness, He actually fulfills righteousness. John the Baptist is out baptizing, Jesus comes down the river, He walked out the whole law. He comes down and He says, John, I need you to baptize me, are you with me? John, I need you to baptize I'm going somewhere with this and I want you to stay with me, okay? Are you with me? Okay, this is all really scriptural. You can pick it apart if you want to, but it won't stand. Because it's God. Because I learned it from Him. Oh, it's so good. It's great. As a matter of fact, I'm preaching something new. So I'm learning from him as I'm speaking to you. So it's really good. I'll get the thing and listen to it. <laughs> it's crazy like that, I promise. So Jesus comes down. He gets baptized. But first he asks John, he said, I need you to baptize me. And John's like, I can't. You need to baptize me because I need your baptism. John couldn't have the baptism that Jesus was going to give him. Because the baptism that Jesus was going to give him was the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost couldn't be poured out. Why? Because the Holy Ghost was there to make us like Jesus. And the Holy Ghost wasn't poured out until Jesus died. Okay, so John's like, I need your baptism. Jesus is like, mm -mm, I need you to baptize me for it's necessary to fulfill all righteousness. Woo! So he goes down the river, comes up, the heavens open legally and never shut again. So why? Because righteousness was fulfilled and the heavens were open legally because God said, by law, you have to walk out the whole law in order for the heavens to be open. It's in Deuteronomy 28. It said, I will open the heavens. See, in the past, there were partial open heavens, little glimpses, big, 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 but they had to be open legally. So Jesus did. They opened up and they never shut. He only closed heavens between your ears. Promise. Come on, because he didn't shut the heavens up. We don't perish for lack of open heaven, we perish for lack of knowledge. knowledge. So what we don't know is killing us in the kingdom. Are you with me? So Jesus opens it up. He attains righteousness. Now it says this. It says, God, be merciful to us and bless us. Here comes the bless us. It's a legal prayer. God will want you to bless us. Well, let me tell you how it happens. God says in Matthew 6, 33, to seek first His kingdom. And... Is righteousness. Well, what does righteousness do? It brings mercy. Why? Because you were shown mercy. Why? Because there were 613 laws that you had to follow in order to obtain mercy. God was a God of justice. Then Jesus satisfied justice. Then God became a God of mercy. Yes, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. But God needed justice to satisfy the wrath. So Jesus satisfied with justice, which turned God into a God of mercy. So now when we understand that, that changes everything. So then we seek first the kingdom of God, and we seek His righteousness. Why kingdom? Kingdom's authority. Kingdom's like not quenching the spirit. The kingdom is God's rulership that rules and governs from within. It governs from within a man's heart. Then all of a sudden it starts to teach your life how to function. Are you with me? So kingdom is authority, but if it's all about authority, and if it's all about power, then you've got a lopsided life. So it's about righteousness because it says seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and then all things will be added to you. What does that mean? You seek first what God said to seek, which is his kingdom which keeps you from quenching the, from, from quenching the spirit. And then you seek his righteousness alongside of it which keeps you from grieving the spirit because your character lines up with everything. Do you know it's possible for your anointing to take you very far and your character not be there yet, it will destroy you. Bah! 
That's why we need both legs underneath the solid thing. Are you with me? So with righteousness, when we see kingdom and righteousness, all of a sudden God says, all these things you worry about. See, there's constant worry. There's constant struggle. We were just listening to a song on the way here. Did anybody ever see Lion King? We were listening to Akuna Matata. It was awesome. I was listening to it. God was speaking to me. He says, why are you down? Oh, you've got to put your behind in your past. And it's like, what? You've got to put your past behind you. Wow, that's amazing. Because God did. Then when righteousness is understood, there's nothing against you. There's no accusation against you. And what does that do to your heart? It keeps you from holding accusation against others. Because when you partner with the accuser, you're actually acting like the devil. And you're bringing judgment upon yourself. And then you wonder why your life is in an uproar and a spin. Why? Because you've always got something to say about somebody else instead of realizing what God has said about you. Come on. When God, this is very healthy. It is because if we if we don't get this, all of a sudden we're bitter, we're angry, we carry all we carry all kinds of stuff, and we actually reap condemnation on ourselves. Why? Because the law brings condemnation. So if you want to judge somebody else, if you want to say that they've got this and they've got that, Jesus said, first take the log out of your eye, then you'll be able to see. Some some translations actually say telephone pole. That's huge. That's a big eye. Do you want to know why he didn't say take the telephone pole out of your eyes? you want to know why he said I? It's easy. Because in the kingdom there's only a single vision. The eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is single, single your whole body will be full of light. Do you know if you only have one eye and you're seen out of it, and if you have a telephone pole in it, you can't see anything. Because if you have a log in this one, you can still see out of that one. Come on. But if you've got a log inside of the one eye that God told you to see through, you're in trouble. And you're actually double-minded. Why? Because you're double-visioned. You're out there. How can you receive anything from God? Are you guys okay? Is this okay? This is really good. It's really healthy. It'll really set us free from us. Because we've got all kinds of beefs with all kinds of people. I meet people every day. How you doing, brother? What do you mean, why do you know? Well, you know, I'm making it, but, uh, no. what are you talking about? Well, and they give me their potter. It's, it's for real. We are so touchy-feely, man. You know that the devil finds out that you're touchy-feely? The world will never see Jesus in you. Oh, that's good. Man, it's really, here. So be merciful to us. Through Jesus he was, if you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God wants to add everything to you. So we worry, we worry, we worry, we worry, we worry. You know, it's right, it's wrapped right in between, like Matthew 6, 22, where it says the eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is, is double, and, and your darkness, and the great, how great is the, the light, it's darkness, and it's dark light. That's not good, right? Come on, seriously. I know I'm joking, but it's for real. Then you get through and he talks about worry. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. Don't worry. Stop worrying. Don't worry. Why? Because, like, look at the birds. They get stuff. And they don't, like, and God just gives it to them. They don't read the store, but God says, here, birds, you're amazing. I created you. Here's your stuff. Come on. Lilies are beautiful. And, like, it's just, you know, they're, they're, even more beautiful than Solomon, which was pretty decked out. Right? And, and then today they're here and gone. At least it's how much more valuable. What is value? Value is that God created you in His own image. God created you to be just like Him. Why did God create us to be just like Him? Because He wanted the devil defeated by one made in His image. But even more than that, He wanted that people to worship Him by choice. Do you know what the choice that people get? The choice that people get is because of the life that you live. Because they see a life that's yielded to God and shines like Jesus Christ and they want what you have. Hallelujah. <laughs> so good. Okay, let's go deeper. It's good. You guys all right? Y'all yeah. kind of making sense here? It says, cause His face to shine upon us 
Selah, which means take a break, that's a good word. And then when you start up again, you're going to start into this. It says that your way may be known on the earth. Wow! That God's way may be known. Wait a minute. God's merciful. Jesus comes, takes the brunt, takes the law, crushes sin completely, raises from the dead, hands us the keys to the kingdom, and we've got keys. What are the keys to? Mercy. Wow! Mercy that I have received mercy, now I'm going to show mercy. I'm just going to become one big mercy. Everywhere I go, people treat me wrong, and then, okay, 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 and I walk away, and you shouldn't have done that. And then someone else does it, because the devil finds out that it moves you, you're in trouble, you'll be moved, I promise. Why? Because he found out your button. You're not supposed to have any. The devil found out that people get on your nerves. You know dead people don't have nerves anymore. <laughs> as silly as it sounds, it's the truth. Do you know that you don't have the right to have nerves? You don't have the right to have a bad day. I understand we go through stuff, but if you go through stuff and stuff your part, you really don't know who you are. I'm talking identity, man. This is solid stuff. It's the reality of the gospel. God paid the price. You know, it doesn't say to deny the devil, pick up your cross and follow him. It just doesn't say that. Why? Because the devil's not your enemy. As much as you are. The devil is not as much of an enemy as you are to yourself. He is your enemy. But it doesn't say to not the devil. It says resist the devil. But after you've denied yourself, and you've, because submission to God is denying yourself, and then in that right there, the devil's already resisted. The problem isn't, like, the problem is the lack of submission. Amen. It's not your strong resistance. You can resist all day long, man. I resist you. Can you devil get behind me? He's already behind you. You don't have to tell him to get there. <laughs> Do you know this is true? Do you know that, like, if I can get this, you better get it? Because I'm really simple. I am. I mean, how many times do we let people get under our skin? Come on, man. You know, it's not legal. <laughs> for me. <laughs> Look, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying this is easy. I'm saying this is the way. You know, this isn't Burger King. It's not having it your way. It's his way. He says you're amazing. He says you're incredible. Sometimes we don't feel incredible. Why? Because a lot of people are getting up on us. So we don't feel incredible because people are being mean to us. You know, Jesus said, that same glory you gave me, God, I'm giving to them. What does that mean? That means that the glory that we had with God in the beginning... Jesus came to restore it. He restored us back to glory. You know the word glory actually is another like awesome. God, is, God restored you to awesome. And the difference between God walking with you is that God lives in you. I sang a song the other day. If you're happy and you know it, live your life. If you're happy and you know it, live your life. If you're happy and you know it, then your walk will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, then you like it. Like It's really good news, man. Get out. <laughs> no, it's all good. You know, it's amazing. You, you come into a house, you go wherever, you go and preach your heart. It doesn't matter what you come into. You go share your heart, and I always share identity. Why? Because that's all that I know. Because my Bible says it's all about your identity. And when you're touchy-feely, you don't know who you are. That's not my word, that's God's. If you're touched, if you're touchy, you will be touched. It's, it's true. It's really true. If you're touchy, you'll be touched. Why? Because you've already made it known that you're touchy. Do you know that if you're touchy, you'll have to hold your pillow at night like a god and thank it for you being there? And then that same pillow that you have to leave in the morning, you'll be very 
sad because you have to wake up and face another day. When I get to my pillow at night, sometimes it's not till morning. Come on, man, when I work, dude, I love my job. Why? Because I was working for the Lord. <laughs> it was awesome. Nobody agreed with me. Didn't matter. I was in love with a man. I was in love with Jesus. Watch this. I'd be on my job. People would be <laughs> squeezing me and being mean to me and acting this way to me. And I refused in my heart to ever allow people sin against me to determine the sin in me. I refused in my heart to allow the way that people treated me to make me treat them wrong. You know, there's a lot of people that want to get into full-time ministry, want to get out of their job because they can't handle their job because they can't handle people. And they want to get out of their job because they can't stand people. And then they want to preach. <laughs> what are you going to do? You've got to preach to people. You're not going to hide in the closet and avoid everybody. I promise you. And your life better line up with what the Word says because you will be stalked. Why? Man, I hear people say higher levels or higher levels, different devils. I could care less about all that stuff. Because God's army is, is amazing. Why? In the natural army, if, if you're a preacher, if you're speaking, if you have a home group, and you say, well, I'm getting attacked, brother, because i got a home group. Knock it off. <laughs> what is that? Do you know how many people go through that? I'm a worship leader. I'm getting stomped. I'm getting attacked. Why? Because uh, I'm a leader. Leaders always get attacked. If, if you're a general in an army, do you have more protection than the privates, or do the privates have more protection than the general? What would make you think that God's army is different? <laughs> do you know that you can allow an attack and you can bring an attack in by the way that you think? You know, as a private, greater seed that's in you than anything in the world. We got that working for us. Yes. Come on. Yes. And the truth is that in God's army, when you're a leader, you're lower. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> so higher levels is a worldly saying. <laughs> Sorry. Not really. <laughs> oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Nations, singing for joy, being happy. What would that look like? Come on. For you shall judge the people righteously. Why are they going to sing for joy? Well, first of all, that God's going to shine and, and let His face shine on you. God's going to shine His face on you. What does that mean? Just that right there. In the Old Testament, Moses got the law. God let His face shine on him. Or His butt, whatever. Because it says that I'm only going to see, you're only going to see my backside. It's weird because Moses spent like 40 days and then another 40 with God's backside and still shine. Do you know that? That's crazy. Had to put a veil on his face because he had the law. Do you know that when you're in condemnation, you still got a veil on your face because you're still under the law? Do you know it talks about it gives the mirror and it says the mirror. Why? See, shining is very important. It says... Let your light so shine before men. Why? So that they can all like know God. Why? How will they know God if I just shine? Because your life will be the outraying image of an indwelling Christ. Christ in you is the hope of glory, but Christ coming out of you is that hope being made manifest everywhere you walk. So that people see your life and want what you have because the light that is in you is incredibly amazing. I call Christians a bug light. I do. Because the bug light is like this bright light that you hang on your back porch. And all these bugs that are in the darkness, they come close and they get zapped. Amen. Why? Because the light's really beautiful and they don't know what it is. It's going to kill them. And they come. And Christians that see your light so shine, they don't really understand. When they get too close, they get zapped by the love of God. It changes their life. changes their reality. And all of a sudden, they're dead too. A lot of people can't even hear me because they're like, well, that's not my experience, man. You're so wrapped up in your circumstances. You're so wrapped up in life. You're so pounded by life itself that you can't even hear the good news. You need to change your life. 
Just give it to Him. Just say, God, you know what? I've messed up. I've been, it's been all about me. I've been offended. I've been hurt. I've felt rejected. Here's a big killer in the church. Well, nobody appreciates me for my gift. That'll kill you. It's not about your gift. Are you glorifying Jesus with it? Or do you want to be known by it? This is pretty heavy. Come on, Jesus. Am I all right? Okay. <laughs> Let's see you guys. Don't you dare leave. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Let me get to the end here. And I'm going to preach something out and share. Are you guys with me? Is this okay? Does this make sense? Yes. It's really good. Oh my gosh, it is. I promise you. <laughs> see, I, I want to cry in my heart because there's so much offense going on in the world. And we're so easily moved by people and how they treat us and how they act. Because we don't like that or we don't like that. And we... We're, and, and the problem is, is because we're looking in a mirror, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Do you know? That means that in the places that you're bound, He's not. And if you're bound by you, so He says, the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all, who? All of us. Why? Because the mercy of God was poured out. And what happened in that? The law was satisfied. Jesus became the curse. He who knew no sin, he became the curse. He was cursed for our sake. All for love's sake became poor. He was, he was crushed, mutilated, marred beyond anything. And all of a sudden, he's resurrected. Wow, that's amazing. It wasn't as amazing as the day that he sat beside God and the Holy Spirit was poured out to make you just like Jesus. That, that's incredible. That's the birthing place of Christianity. That's amazing. So mercy's poured out. God wants to bless us. He wants us to seek righteousness. He wants us to seek His kingdom. Then all these things will be added to you. What's that? The blessings of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28. All that stuff comes. You're the head, not the tail, above, not beneath. All your enemies are going to come this way and flee from us up in different ways. going to open the heavens. It's going to cause rain. So many times, we're touching feely. When you're touching feely, it's because you're looking in the mirror with a veil on your face and you don't see you can transform. But when you look in the mirror with an unveiled face, talks about the reading of the Old Testament. When people read the Old Testament with the veil, they have a veil and they can't really get it because they see the wrath of God, because they see the judgment of God, because they see the law of God, and they don't really get the picture, but when they realize who they are because of the new creation reality, because you've been born again and you're under blood and you're under grace and you're under mercy and you're not under law, then all of a sudden the veil's removed. What happens? What happened? If Moses would have came off the mountain without a veil on his face, what would have happened? Nobody could look at him. Why? Because he shined because he was in the presence of God. What is that scripture in there for? He's talking about us looking in the mirror, seeing who we really are without a veil on our face, being able to see Christ in us, the hope of glory, being transformed into the original image. What's the image? The image of God. See, God didn't just recreate or didn't just give you a brand new slate. He didn't just say, okay, I'm going to wipe out your past and give you a do-over. It's not what he said. It's not about, I'm going to give you a second chance. You blew the first one. You might blow the second one. See, God is a God of second chances. It's a great VeggieTales song. I get it. Little kids, that's awesome. But the reality of this thing is God didn't just give you a, new, a second chance. He gave you a new life. Amen. He gave you every, He gives you every opportunity to manifest Him and not you. Because the truth is, is that God, by mercy and grace, gave you breath today. One more day for you to manifest Him and not you. And when you're angry at people, when you're bitter at people, when you have ought against another because of what they did or what they said or how they walk or how they talk, you're actually bringing judgment upon yourself and you've got a veil on your face and you need that sucker pulled off. Why? 
why would the nations want to have anything to do with God? Do you know it says that you, God, are going to cause all, all people to fear us? Do you know what? That kind of fear is different. Then people won't be afraid of you because you're a Christian. They'll be in awe of you because you shine. Do you know what it's like to have your workplace like totally bitter and angry and just persecute you and all of a sudden like it doesn't matter? And and because you've never allowed sin against you to produce sin in you and and because you knew who you were. And when they, when they said mean things to you, you would just tell them they're amazing? I do. Why? Because that's where God groomed me. That's why I still live in the same place with different people. Why would I allow someone's anger and bitterness and wrath against me to cause anger and bitterness and plank in me? I've got a new eye. I've got a new perspective. It's called kingdom. It's all over the Bible. It says in 2 Corinthians that you're a brand new creation. But right before that it says, you know what? I'm no longer going to regard anybody according to the flesh. Why? Because if they mess up, they just don't know who they are. How are they ever going to know who they are if you don't know who you are? Because you keep judging them. And when you use y'all let this hit your heart because it's really good. It says, I regard nobody according to the flesh. We once regarded Jesus according to the flesh, but no longer. Why? Because he came as a man and defeated the devil as a man made in his image. And in the Old Testament, you could judge somebody according to their flesh because they were twisted. But in the New Testament, we get brand new flesh. Oh, man. People talk about how their flesh is sinful and it's nasty and I fight my flesh. Do you fight your flesh? You're under the law. Why? Because you can't fight your flesh by, by fighting your lip or biting your tongue. You can't do that. Do you know that if you're married, do you know it says no one like no one hates his own wife, but he loves his wife, and he cherishes his wife like he cherishes his own flesh. No one ever hated his flesh, but he cherished it. Why? Because he's going to love his wife, just like Christ loved the church. It's in there for purpose. Not to war against your flesh. If you war against it, you're not realizing it's already finished. It's okay because it's a lot. It's only one song. There's a whole lot of them in there. <laughs> this Bible is full of good news. Did you know that when you read the Old Testament, you can actually preach the law on people and, and hurt people, and it be the letter, and it kill people? Or you can read the Old Testament because you know who you are and see Jesus in the whole thing. Do you know it's illegal to read the Old Testament without knowing who you are in Christ? Because there's still a veil there. But when you find out who you are in Christ, the veil is removed. And when you read the Old Testament, you'll see Jesus the whole way through it. And all of a sudden, it's amazing. You realize that God was just pointing out their need for God. Pointing out the Messiah to come. They prophesied about the Messiah to come. What's scary is that people memorize Scripture and learn Scripture, and they know all these things, and they still act like hell. They still live like hell. They still treat people like hell. They still judge people like, <clears throat> like they're horrible. It's not okay. You know, Pharisees did that, right? Do you understand that? Yeah. You can become a Pharisee really quick. All you got to do is think that you're better than them, put them beneath you. And all of a sudden, you can't see anymore. Because you try to take something out of theirs and forget that when you enter into that place, there's a huge log inside of you because you're under the law again. And you're in trouble. Are you guilty? Absolutely. Do you deserve to die? Yep. Why? Because you entered back into a covenant that God says is dead. You entered into Satan's covenant, actually. This is a dead covenant, and he will warp you, twist you, compel you to, to act on evil. He will have you evil speak. He will put you in an envy place. He will put you in malice, wrath, bitterness, unforgiveness, and all of a sudden, you'll be destroyed. Why? Because it's all about you. Because guess what? It's all about Satan. Yeah. And he will make you his, his image. Are you with me? It sounds like a heavy word, but it's a real safe word. Really, yeah. It's really, 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 really good. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm at my workplace and I'm with people that are angry and mad and don't want anything to do with me. And all I would do is love them. And they would be mean to me and say, you, whatever, really mean stuff. Actually, they'd actually swear with Jesus in me. 
You know, kid, really bad, like way worse than the JC. <laughs> way. I was the fire player, dude. I was, I was with construction dudes. They're not all on page with all that. <laughs> and I'm a brand new Christian, and I am like on fire. Well, I'm not on fire with just zeal. I'm on fire with the Holy Ghost. I'm on fire with the love of God. See, the fire of God is the love of God. Because His love is what purifies everything. Why? His love covers a multitude of sins. So now I've got people that are committing sin against me. And because I love them, I'm covering their sin. Well, how can you do that? They rebuke Jesus because He was the man who's trying to forgive sins. How can you do that? Well, it's easy. Jesus says in John 20, 21, He says, As the Father sent me, so I sent you. What does that mean? Same way he sent Jesus. We got that going on for us. That's what he said. But yeah, he was talking to his disciples. Well, that's true. But in Matthew 28, he said, Teach them everything I commanded you. He commanded them. He sent them. As the Father sent me, I send you. He didn't say, I'm gonna. He didn't say, I want to. He didn't say, I might. He said, I do. So he sent us. As the Father sent him. And Jesus goes through. Watch this. Oh! You ready? Yeah. Almost done. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, you're so good. Where was I going to go? I was going to go somewhere. You could go anywhere. It's just all amazing. I was going to go here. Okay, that's all I was going to do. <laughs> a lot of times I've been in churches and had to like bring correction because when they saw that they thought get that devil off the stage <laughs> okay let's go to uh, we'll finish it out with this do you understand that? Like, God shines on us and we can shine. It, says that it doesn't say this little light of mine. It says you're the light of the world. Huh? What does that mean? That means that like, wherever you go, you illuminate. Love light. Like, no matter where you go, no matter what your workplace is, no matter how angry people are, no matter how bitter people are, if you allow people's bitterness, bitterness against you to produce bitter in you, what are you? You're pottered by circumstance and you're conformed to the world and you look just like the world. Why other people want what we have if they can't see Jesus? You know it's possible? I promise. If I can walk this out, I don't care who you are. The only person, the only reason why you could is because you don't believe. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So in verse 19 of John 20, I didn't tell you, sorry. John 20. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, where the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, because they were really, really scared of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. <clears throat> There's a lot in that. I just want to get to a point here. So Jesus said to them, Peace to you. Wow. Why do you say peace? Because they were really freaked out. <laughs> peace to you. As the Father sent me, I send you. And he breathed on him, and he said, Receive the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it says, I want to draw your attention to here, because this is, this is huge. If you, forsee it, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. See, Jesus 
you know, they, they lower people through roofs, and Jesus is like, they kick a hole in the roof, Jesus is like, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Whoa. Who's this guy think he is to forgive sin? Right? And he shows the he shows the correlation between sickness and, and forgiveness, and he says, you know what, which is more important to say that you're pick up your mat and walk or that your sins are forgiven? And he says, but to show you that the son has authority to forgive sin. Pick up your mat and walk. Why? You're forgiven, now be healed. That's crazy good. Get it? Okay, so then Jesus does it another time, it happens in another place, and they reason in their hearts, it happens again. Then he gives us like a blood covenant, you know, and then we take communion and we understand we, we drink the juice because we're forgiven, or drink the wine because we're forgiven, and then we eat the bread because the bodies are healed. Healing and forgiveness is one package. Alright, so then we've got the scripture here, because Jesus said, because they said, who, who, how can he forgive sin? Only God can. Jesus is like, I'm just like him. Do you know that when he said that, he put it, when he said God's my father, he put it right on the same thing, right on par with him. Do you understand that? But in Philippians 2, it said he humbled himself, became a bondservant, became of no reputation. Even though he, he was equal with God, he considered it nothing. That's amazing because he's given a model for Christianity. Because even though God has given us the same spirit, which means God, the Holy Spirit lives in us. I mean, God lives in us. That means when we consider ourselves equal with God, it's that God lives in us and God's equal with God. Do you get it? Okay, but Jesus says this. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, then they're retained. What does that mean? God said, as the Father sent me, Jesus said, because only Jesus said what God said, because he never said anything unless God said it. Get it? So he said it, and actually the word is God. It's all inspired. It's breathed by God. Do you agree with that? That should be very important that we agree with that one right there. So, so Jesus said it. If you, who? The disciples. Well, that was the disciples. Yeah, but in Matthew 28, he said, go and teach them all the same things I commanded you. So he commanded them to forgive sins. He also, in the same command, says you can retain them. That's scary. That's scary. That the power of life and death is in your tongue. So you can choose to speak life and render forgiveness, or you can choose to speak death and harbor bitterness. Oh my gosh, this is so amazing. You've got to see this. See, you represent God. You represent God. Judgment was satisfied. Justice was nailed to the tree. It was nailed. God needed justice. I talked about it last night with a couple individuals about justice and he wanted to pay for him and he couldn't because there was sin in his life and there was no way. And then Jesus says, well, I'll do it. And then all of a sudden, the judge is like, let me check the records. Wow, you have no sin. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Bang. Becomes the substitute. Actually, you hung on the cross. It wasn't just like a substitute in that, like a substitute teacher. He was a propitiation. He was the exact representation of you on the tree. And then you've got forgiven. And so all of a sudden, you come into a place where you're forgiven. Your conscience gets clean from all the dead works and all the bad things that you ever did. It gets wiped out. You start walking with a clean conscience. And then someone does something to you. <clears throat> and as soon as you hold it in your heart. Because what you do is when you hold something against somebody else, that person finds out that you've got something against them. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> it renders in their heart. <clears throat> and they pray for you. But then... Then you are mad at somebody, and then you give the word to somebody else that you're mad at somebody, and then you give the word to them, and all of a sudden it gets to the third person, and all of a sudden you've got half the church mad at somebody about something that's escalated and maybe not even something they did. And you've chosen to take your biblical dominion of kingdom authority and righteous identity, and you've taken it off and take it off Christ and put on the devil, put on the accuser, and acted like you're the great judge. And now you'll be judged. Oh my gosh. So all of a sudden, this scripture's in there because you're a representative of God. If you can't render forgiveness, how can people know that God's forgiving? What brings people to repentance? Your judgment, your anger, your bitterness, your wrath, you're pointing the finger at them, you're telling them that they're wrong. 
or that you represent a good and loving God. And it's actually the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. It's not just that, that they know that God's good, but that you're the representative of God. And if you can't be good, then no one will know God. Why? Because He made a new covenant so that God can live in you, so that you can walk like Jesus. And when you say, I forgive you, they go, okay. Come on, when you ever walk up to someone and say, listen, I just want to tell you that. I've had people walk up to me after service and say, when you first came in, I really, I saw you and I was like, just cast judgment on you. They come up crying. They're like, you're a man of God. I just want to apologize. I'm like, man, that's cool. I'm at a place that, that I've been at since the beginning where I've never harbored bitterness one day. Why? Because like, I was horrible and God set me free from me. And if God can do it for me, He can do it for anybody. But if you harbor unforgiveness over somebody, you actually retain their sin and keep them bound. Why? Because you're a representative of God. God's given you dominion, He's given you authority, and you're the one that is instead of Jesus. And you might be the only Jesus that someone sees. And your heart will be all twisted up and you'll have all kinds of excuses to remain bitter and angry. They did this to me and they did that to me. I've got one good word for you. If you think they deserve this because of what they did, then you deserve hell for all the things that you deserve. You with me? It's really true. It's hard to digest because we go through all kinds of hell. Not realizing that the hell around you is actually dominated by the Christ that's in you. If you know who you are, but if you don't know who you are, all of a sudden, you have allow that hell to dominate your circumstances and you're in rebellion. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah. That's yeah. really good. <laughs> God, I just thank you for your peeps. God, that we would act, that means people. I thank you for your people that, that we would be able to shine like Jesus, that the world would see Christ in us, that the world would see who we really are. Because you created us to be like you, God. You said, who's ever sinned, we retain, or retain, and who's ever sinned, we forgive, or forgiven. <clears throat> God, we've been forgiven. And we, we want to walk in, in complete, just unoffendableness. We want to be unoffendable, because God, the gospel says that we can actually be dead, and it's hard to offend a dead one. Not just in theory, but in reality. Because if we die with Christ, then sin shall no longer have dominion in us. Reckon yourself dead to sin. <clears throat> Why? Because Jesus, he who knew no sin, became sin, so we might become righteousness. So God, it says anybody that practices righteousness is righteous just as Jesus is righteous. It says anybody... Anybody that purifies himself, or, or he, he who knows this purifies himself just as he is pure. It says, if anyone says that he abides in Christ, ought walk just as Jesus walked. It's not unattainable. Jesus attained it. His justice was satisfied so that mercy could prevail. Father, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus that everyone's heart would be rent in such a place where if there's any kind of stuff in there, that we would just let it go. Because when we harbor bitterness or anger or attitudes, all of a sudden, we've got attitude. So God, I'm asking you to crush it and bless the people, God, so that we can shine, so that people would actually want what we have. Because it's not good that people see more animosity inside the church than they do on the street. God, thank you for the love of God prevailing, and thank you for this church becoming a lighthouse. <coughs> A lighthouse, God, in the midst of darkness. Oh, thank you for grace. Wow. God, I just ask you, I ask you to remit, God, these people, these people that are angry, I just ask you to remit and remove it, God. I just, I come on behalf of as your son, God, and I thank you that I choose to admit their stuff right now. <laughs> Jesus, I just thank you for freedom. 
God, I, I just I remit angry words and, and just they said this and he said that, and she said this. And let's cancel that stuff, God. Even people that aren't here right now because of that very thing. God, I thank you for grace. I thank you for mercy. That this house would be known as a house of mercy. Jesus. <clears throat> Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for grace. Amen. If you've got sickness or, or hurting in your body, I need you to stand up and we'll pray. If you're going to sit there and have a symptom, you're lying. So go stand up. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Is it good? Okay. All right. We'll pray. Joe, can you surround? Why don't you go back there? Dean, Destiny, Gabriel. Let's talk to Pastor Dean. We're going to pray for you back. All right. Doctor, it's very important. This we're going to pray for Pastor Dean.